Welcome everybody. I'm Melissa Lord. I'm a member of the Manchester IOP branch and I work with the Ogden Trust as a regional rep as well, all promoting physics. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Mark Wrigley to everybody, or maybe I should say to welcome Mark back since he gave a talk to Manchester Institute of Physics branch recently about the Apollo mission. Now, Mark's really active in the IOP, both nationally and in the Yorkshire branch, where he leads outreach, one of his passions, engaging others with the importance of physics and how it can transform lives as well. Mark's from Yorkshire, born in Sheffield, and he studied physics at both Leeds and Sheffield universities, though he did brave Leicester for some later studies. His life has taken him to live in really diverse places though, and his work has covered so many applications of physics that it's really hard to go through them all. But it does include lighting technology, infrared pyrometers, mobile phone tech, all sorts. He's even been a uh, physicist in residence at an arts centre, which is a real swapping of the type of roles I've heard, where you have an artist in a science centre. And I think that role's just brilliant. His interest in astronomy and technology have led him to combine the two in a PyCon telescope. I might not be saying that right, Mark can correct it. And that's the world's first 3D printed telescope. And that's going to be the focus of his talk this evening. So I'll hand over to Mark. Right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and we'll we'll start the talk. Right, we should have the screen the first slide up. So thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm Mark Wrigley. I'm a, a fellow of the Institute of Physics. Um, I did realize the other day um, that, in fact, it was 50 years ago this October that I was a fresher at Leeds University uh, studying physics. Um, I'm now retired. I have what's called a side hustle, which is all about promoting physics through making things. So before I start, um, I'm just going to explain what it is I'm talking about. Um, this is the PyCon telescope. Um, what is it? Um, it is a telescope made out of 3D printed parts um, and um, it uses a Raspberry Pi camera instead of an eyepiece. Um, and uh, there are a few non 3D printed parts. So there's bits here like a focusing rack that needs a cog. Uh, the tube itself is actually a three, um, sorry, the tube itself is actually a ventilation shaft from an extractor system. Uh, so it's a five millimeter diameter tube. How does it work? Uh, well, it's very um, similar to the standard Newtonian reflecting telescope, except that um, the uh, uh, 45 degree mirror and the eyepiece have been removed and a Raspberry Pi camera has been placed at the focal point of the mirror with the lens removed. So before I get into too much uh, detail about that. I, I sort of want to explain a little bit why I see physics as being so important. Uh, and some of it's based on, on my life experiences. Um, but basically, I found that having a physics degree has been the key to social mobility, uh, that it's open doors. Um, the other thing is that we, we live in a very fast paced technological society. And it worries me at times that to be able to participate in decisions of that society, you really need to understand what's going on. Also, I find, uh, I'll, I'll use this term later, physics, physicists are great disruptors. Physicists don't particularly like the status quo. They like to think of the next thing that's going to happen. And um, in, in that respect, it's very similar to technology. Technology moves along at a very fast pace. And everybody's concerned about what is the next thing that's going to happen. And then finally, I'd say physicists are great innovators. And this is because they have a view over many different subjects. And I've found in my experience that the best way to innovate is to bring people together from different disciplines. And usually innovation happens. So physicists are in a good position to create that environment. 
So as an example of fast moving technology, on the right hand side of this picture, there's a mobile phone, which was the very first digital mobile phone in Europe to be type approved. And I was part of the company who delivered that. Um, and this was around about 1992. So we're now at 5G, this is a 2G phone. But the disruption was that this was digital and not analog. And I think the thing I have to reflect on is that this is only 15 years after I graduated. In but in fact, many of the things in there never existed when I was doing my degree. So how did I become a physicist? Um, it was not through a love of complicated mathematics. Uh, it was actually through making stuff. Um, and I can uh, show you a few examples of the sort of things I was into. I've already told you about reel-to-reel -reel tape recordings of uh, the uh, Apollo missions, but um, I was into things like airfix kits, uh, amateur radio. I, I was a teenager at the time that there were a lot of televisions being replaced, so I used to tinker with televisions. Uh, I'm sure that anybody of my age on this call can remember the Sinclair mini radio, which had three transistors and we, we, we all made. Um, so, uh, and, and ironically, I used to get into a lot of trouble at the time um, at, at school because I wasn't focusing on my studies. I was, I was uh, you know, dissipating my energies in, the, in this way. Uh, um, lots of the stuff I learned from doing it came in very handy later in my career. So I spend a lot of time, sorry, we, uh, I spend a lot of time at the Institute of Physics. I, I was uh, council, uh, on council for a few years. And um, one of the things we often do is go get together and when we meet uh, new people, we'll, we'll sit around the table and say, how, how did you get into physics? And so to my delight, I found that many of them came from the same route that I had, that they'd all got hobbies of radio hams or similar. Uh, and I realized that there was a bit of a link between encouraging people uh, to get into physics and making things. With that in mind, uh, I um, introduced making activities into our outreach. And the idea here was that instead of, uh, well, what often happens at science fairs when we do things that make the public go, wow, um, they'll stay for five minutes and clear off and forget about us. So the idea here was to engage people sit them down for uh, uh, 20 minutes and let them make something and actually take it home. Uh, and the, the activity here is uh, an activity with laser cut model hoists, which are hydraulically powered, uh, but we, we've done other things as well. So I found that really worked very well in outreach. Being of a certain age, um, one of the things that really impressed me in the 1980s was the advent of affordable home computing. Um, when I was at Leeds, I learned how to program a mainframe PDP-11 uh, computer using Fortran. Uh, didn't quite use punch cards, but this was a massive thing on the top floor of the physics block. Uh, and then, so the, the whole idea of having a computer at home um, was quite a thrill. Um, and actually, both of my, my sons got into computing th this way uh, and went on to be physicists. So I'm not sure if there's a link there. I bought it because I'd moved to a new company. Um, and, uh, Melissa mentioned uh, the um, infrared parameter before. I was designing infrared parameters to fit into jet aircraft and monitor the temperature of turbine blades, which... Uh, used in military aircraft to top temperature limit the blades. And the company that I'd gone to work for had um, not got a mainframe computer, but at the time PCs were coming in. Uh, so they set up, being an old fashioned aviation company, they set up a committee and the committee examined what was on the market. And a year later, they came back and reported what they'd found and which computer to standardize. Unfortunately, a year later, computing had moved so quickly that most of the models they'd looked at were now obsolete. So I just got fed up and went out and bought a Commodore computer and did, did the work on that. And uh, there are still aircraft, I think, today flying around with my, my designs from the Commodore. 
So fast forward a little, um, around about um, 2012, 2013, I started to notice that there was a um, move to home 3D printing. Um, and I found that that's, that was quite exciting. Um, this printer that I've got a picture of is actually the one we used on the project. It's called Amendel 90, and it's from a project called RepRap. Uh, which um, makes 3D printers from 3D printed parts and uses open hardware so that anybody can make their own 3D printer uh, without having to buy anything. Um, so um, I was quite interested in this and we'll talk a little bit more. Um, the other technology that uh, was around uh, was this thing called the Raspberry Pi. And so I had sort of flashbacks of my experiences with the Commodore 64, but at a, a much higher level. So the Raspberry Pi was very similar to the sort of computers you used to, used to buy in the early 80s. It didn't have a monitor, you used your television screen. Uh, there's a couple of sockets here, USBs, where you can plug in a keyboard and mouse. Uh, and uh, you can um, do some fairly sophisticated computing. And uh, uh, they're saying 16 pounds here, but at the time, I think a decent one cost around about 20 pounds. So that, that was quite an exciting prospect. Uh, the other thing is being a bit of a photography buff, um, this thing came with a camera. Uh, and um, the first camera was a five megapixel uh, camera, um, which um, looked quite interesting. So I wanted to do something that put these two things together. Uh, and um, encourage people who will call themselves makers or, or citizen scientists uh, to do more stuff uh, and do things with 3D printing. Um, and being a Yorkshireman, I, I thought it would be rather good if I could get somebody else to buy a 3D printer for me to play with. So I applied to Sheffield University, who have a thing called Festival of the Mind. And Festival of the Mind is run every two years. Um, Apart from lots of other events, they have uh, what they call a Spiegel tent, which is like a big top, which is put outside John Lewis in Sheffield, where people do talks. And um, it's very often poetry or dance or music. And I wanted to get some science in there. So I applied to do this thing, which was the PyCon. Uh, and simply because there were two technologies, I sort of thought, well, what, how could we combine these in something interesting? and came up with this thing, um, which originally was called a disruptive technology telescope. And the aim, although we didn't quite make it, was to make a telescope for less than a hundred pounds. I did get some uh, pushback from some of my friends, uh, particularly um, uh, somebody came up to me and said, why on earth are you encouraging kids to be disruptive? Um, you know, we've got enough problems in the classroom as it is without that. And so I had to sort of explain what, what's meant by disruptive technology. So the best example I can give is perhaps the, the valve and the transistor. Disruptive technology is when a technology comes along and completely displaces a existing market. So a good example, late 50s, early 60s, we saw valves disappearing rapidly from valve radios and similar to be replaced by transistors. And of course, we all know where that led to eventually. But it's that idea of something that comes along and changes everything. And I realized now at the end of my career that it's not an unusual thing in technology. In fact, what you know, I worked in mobile phones. When we started, we were talking about people talking to each other on the phone. Now we've got a device that is a data uh, device which virtually all, all most of the conversations are by data rather than voice so things change and change very rapidly so here's here's the bits uh, of a PyCon telescope that are 3d printed um, this is the, the the production design that we have now so I'm going to use this as a, a segue into talking about how what you have to do to create something on a 3d printer and if we're talking about doing it from scratch, the very first thing that you've got to do is to design something. And you design that in computer-aided design software. 
and you would end up with a file that is called an STL file. And an STL file just contains all the information about the physical aspects of whatever it is you've designed. It doesn't contain any information to tell a 3D printer how to print it. So the 3D printer requires a set of instructions of how to go about printing whatever it is that you've designed. And that's called slicing. And so it's another soft piece of software where you will load in an STL file and you'll come away with something called a G-code, which is a set of instructions specific to your 3D printer that tells the printer what to do. And then of course you print it. And at the end of the process, you end up with a physical object. So to start that, uh, we go down this route of designing something. And back uh, seven years ago, when we started this project, uh, the obvious thing to use was something called FreeCAD. And free um, computer aided design packages can actually be quite expensive now, very expensive licenses. But FreeCAD is something that is free to download from the internet and is maintained by enthusiasts who keep adding to it. Um, quite frankly, I found it quite intimidating to start with. Um, there's a lot to it, and particularly because people do keep adding stuff to it, it was quite difficult. Um, the way that I found to do it was to get online and go and look at some YouTube videos. And there are lots and lots of YouTube videos that tell you how to get started. So that's what we did. So more recently, uh, there's another uh, free uh, computer aided design package, and it's called Tinkercad. Um, this is slightly different from, uh, from FreeCAD in that uh, you don't download the software. You uh, go to a website and you manipulate things on the website and you have an account there. And it basically works in a very simple way in that you've got a variety of shapes, which are down the right hand side of the picture, and you can add them together, uh, you can change their dimensions, uh, you can also subtract them. So for example, if you want to put a hole in something, you would take a cylinder and subtract it from whatever it is you're working on. Uh, it has its limitations, but for a beginner, it's a really good uh, intuitive piece of software and fairly easy to use. So let's get on to how does the 3D printer work? Uh, well, we can thank our old friend, Rennie Descartes, for his Cartesian coordinates. Um, most 3D printers have a nozzle which um, pumps out melted plastic and moves it in an X, Y and Z direction. So my analogy for, for how, um, how this works, I often talk about icing a cake. Um, if you want to create a cube in icing, the best way to do it would be to ice a square and then ice another square on top of it and another and another until you get a cube. And that's exactly what happens on a 3D printer. So what we have here is a nozzle which heats plastic. So this is a drum of plastic filament that's three millimeters in diameter. It's with a stepper motor, it's forced through a nozzle and out of the end of your icing bag basically. And then you can control where it's putting, um, putting plastic down in the X and Y. So the Y is this way. And underneath here, there's a stepper motor which moves this platform backwards and forwards. Above on this gantry, there's a stepper motor on the side which moves the uh, nozzle to the left and right. And so you start printing, it goes down to the surface. And these two stepper motors here turn a threaded rod, which makes it move up one tenth of a millimeter, usually, every time you print a layer. And you wait and it slowly prints a layer. And it does take a long time. So, um, as I mentioned, the RepRap project, which was uh, something which was done in the previous Festival of the Mind, um, uh, my contact at Sheffield University uh, was involved in that project and recommended that we get uh, a kit of parts so that somebody else had printed uh, to construct a 3D printer. And the cost of this, to put a price tag on for things in 2014, was 600 pounds. And you can see here, all these white bits are 3D printed. Um, there's various other bits. Somewhere there's a power supply, there's a power supply, heated bed, 
some um, uh, some sheets which form the frame of the printer, uh, lots of nuts, bolts and screws and a very, very good instruction manual how to put it all together. Um, here, here we've got it assembled and we're just talking to the um, onboard control panel, which is behind here uh, with a, a just a Windows computer. Uh, here it's, it's um, leveling the uh, beds. So we've taken the nozzle away and put a, a gauge and moving the gauge around the bed so that we can check that it doesn't, it, that it's completely um, parallel to the track of, of the nozzle. And printing the first print, uh, we got a G code already from uh, the printer. Uh, so it came with a G code for something that to us to print as a trial. Uh, it wasn't that easy. We had a lot of spaghetti. <clears throat> we found that the first thing that's important in 3D printing is getting good adhesion of the first layer to the bed. And um, after some research, found that the best way to do that was to dilute some PVA glue and paint it on the, on the bed before we start printing. So we did finally get a fully uh, correctly printed um, Android robot, which was the G-code supplied. So we'd got this far. Uh, we'd, um, we'd got the 3D printer constructed and we'd use a G-code that we knew about um, to print something. So the next step to eliminate variables was to import a design, which we'd not done, and see if we could slice it. And uh, some of my lighthearted friends suggested that we go to a site called Thingiverse where 3D printing designs are kept for anybody to use. And they had spotted some 3D um, steampunk goggles, which we had to go at printing. And there's the goggles. Uh, we sprayed them copper to make them look a bit more steampunk. And the lenses are just, um, uh, I think, the 52 millimeter skylight lenses from a camera. So the final thing then in this process was to design something in uh, FreeCAD take it through the process of slicing it and printing it, which is uh, the final step and what we did. Uh, and I have to say that it is quite a satisfying thing to sit down in the morning with some CAD software and design something and then actually have it in your hand in the afternoon. So that this is a prototype uh, mirror base. Uh, we've put three screws, three spring loaded screws in there to be able to align the mirror. And uh, here's, here's the prototype. Um, we did a bit of cheating. Uh, we used um, a, a, a dovetail wedge from an old telescope uh, and used the telescope a tripod to mount everything. Um, we didn't um, use uh, 3D printed parts for the rack. Uh, and this, this is the, uh, the Raspberry Pi case from a company in Sheffield called Pi Maroni. Uh, used Meccano here and there. A uh, nice, funny little story. Once we'd, once we'd done the project, I uh, got some feedback from somebody who was quite irate. Uh, it obviously spent a lot of money on an expensive telescope, and there we were with this £100 uh, piece of kit. And he said, I, I bet you've even got Lego in there. And I was pleased to be able to tell him, no, we don't have Lego in there. We, in fact, use Meccano. But it didn't seem to satisfy him very much. And there's the Meccano bit that we used uh, to do the rack. So then onto the Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, as I said before, um, this, uh, this was a little computer that is still around now. Um, at the time we did the project, uh, they were coming up to having sold 1 million units. Um, I, well, I went online today and see if I could find some up-to-date figures uh, and I could only find them up to 2019, but by 2015, they'd sold 5 million. By 2017, they'd sold uh, 12.5 million, which is slightly more than the number of Commodore 64s that were ever sold. And by 2029, sorry, 2019, they'd sold 30 million. So we must be up to something like 40 or 50 million units sold. This is the unit that we used in the original project. It's called a Model B+. Um, I I'll, will explain um, what a lot of the terminals and things do in a, another um, slide. 
This is um, the uh, camera again. Uh, it's very small. Uh, the dimensions of the printed circuit board are 25 millimeters by 25 millimeters. So by putting it in the barrel of the telescope, it, does, it doesn't really take up that much more uh, surface uh, than, than a, a 45 degree mirror would. Uh, we're now up to version, um, I think we're up to Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, and uh, this is the pinout, or if you buy a Raspberry Pi now, this is what you'd get. Um, there's a whole set of connectors here for connecting to physical things. Uh, uh, the people into robotics and so on would be very interested in that. Uh, there's a network connection, uh, but also it has uh, onboard Wi-Fi, so you don't need to connect to it physically to a network connection. There are now four USB terminals. There's a sound terminal, which is a standard 3.5 millimeter jack. The latest version can support two monitors. So there are two micro uh, USB, uh, sorry, two micro HDMI outputs. There's a power connector. And then the final thing I wanted to talk about is an SD slot. And the use of the SD card replaces what would normally be a hard drive on a, a conventional computer. So um, the early versions had an SD, the, the later versions have a micro SD uh, card, and it, um, it can be bought preloaded with something called no uh, Noobs, which stands for new out of box software. Um, and um, it, the new out of box software can also be downloaded from the internet onto a blank SD card. Um, the software that's contained is Linux based and it has a Linux mix, uh, which is uh, most popular called Raspbian. Um, there are other mixes. You can use this device for things like a uh, home media system and there's a, a mix for that, but the most common is Raspbian. And this is what the uh, screen would look like on the, um, on the Raspberry Pi once you boot it up. Uh, in the mix, you get all sorts of stuff. Uh, there's a software package called Scratch, which is a visual software package for younger people. Uh, you're able to program in Python. Uh, there's other stuff. I think there's a sort of standard word processing stuff on there. And I think there's even um, some um, program which will allow you to um, play with Minecraft and make your own Minecraft uh, ideas. Uh, here's, here's the camera. Um, this is a picture of the camera with the lens removed, which is what we have to do to make the PyCon. Uh, the size of the sensor is 3.6 millimeters that way and 2.4 millimeters that way. Uh, it is slightly tricky to get the lens out because uh, it's set in the factory with uh, some Loctite uh, so that it's at the perfect focus for use. Uh, so you have to give it a little bit of a twist uh, to get it undone. But once it's clicked, it simply unscrews. What can you expect from the results? Uh, uh, how, what can you see with a PyCon? Um, well, uh, we've got the sensor, which is um, 3.6 by 2.4 at uh, in the prototype, 800 millimeters away from the lens. Uh, so I had to go back to some of my, uh, in fact, I had to go online to remember some of my uh, trigonometry, uh, but uh, that gives you an octan of 3.6 over 800, which is about a quarter of a degree. And so uh, if you look at the moon, uh, then it subtends an angle of about half a degree at your eye. So you'd expect uh, when you're using PyCon to see about half the moon. And that's what we got. Uh, these are the first shots uh, from the PyCon. Um, by this time in the project, uh, Sheffield University had put a uh, public relations company onto um, the case uh, because they thought it was a project that they'd like to publicize a little. Um, we'd just gone through the whole process of making this telescope and getting it to work, and we were quite happy to point it at some trees across the street to make sure it did. However, the public relations company wanted us to get some astronomical images. Um, and. Um, we had a series of cloudy nights and when it wasn't cloudy, the moon was in the wrong position. But eventually um, I got the telescope with me when I was visiting friends in Leon Solent. Um, so I took my uh, transit van, which had an inverter in the back and took it to a car park uh, near, near the sea. 
and took some shots across the Isle of Wight. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I was quite surprised I didn't get stopped by the police because there I've got this transit van with a, a monitor in the back and something that looked like a bazooka pointing out over the Solent, but uh, nobody actually stopped me. And the result of all this, uh, there's another shot. Um, so we did the presentation. Um, it was the first one was on September the 19th. I know that because it was my birthday. Uh, I was actually in um, a, a pizza hut celebrating after the first talk. Um, and I got a message on my phone saying, have you seen the BBC website? And um, what happened was that we got into the mainstream press. So first of all, on the South Yorkshire BBC website, but then we went on to get mentions on the Metro Pint newspaper and Mail Online. Um, and usual sort of press things, uh, you know, first 3D printer ever, etc. Um, but um, we'd set up a little website um, on uh, WordPress uh, to tell people what we were doing. And that website went ballistic. Uh, we'd been getting something like six hits a week, and suddenly we were getting thousands of hits. And uh, some, some of my friends said, you know, you should, you should crowdfund this. Um, it would be a good way of getting it into the hands of more people. Uh, and so that's what we did. Uh, we worked with a company called Indiegogo. Now, the trick about crowdfunding is you don't just go and put your stuff on a crowdfunding website and hope. Uh, it took a year to build up a following before we launched as a crowdfund. Uh, we built up a email list of about 600 people, uh, constantly uh, doing shows, going to make affairs, uh, getting, it, uh, getting it known and basically building up a latent demand. And, and the reason you do that is that if you don't, um, when people go to crowdfunding websites, they like to see what other people have done. So if you've not done that, and when they go to your website, there's 20 pounds there, and one of them's from your mum, they don't really get excited about it. But if they see something that's rapidly increasing and uh, taking off, then people, people will, 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 will invest in, in your, your project. And so we did that. We, we got um, slightly more than we'd asked for uh, in terms of the crowdfunding, and we were able to ship about 200 of these devices uh, to people all over the world. Um, and from there, we went on to put the, well, we, we updated the uh, uh, website uh, with all the instructions how to build one. Um, and uh, we uh, put a Shopify shop together after the crowdfunding is finished. So now you can go to the Shopify shop and you can buy bits. Um, uh, you can just buy the mirror if you want it. You can buy the kit of parts, not including 3D printed bits, or you, you can buy the kit with the 3D printed bits. Um, and the point of all this is that we want to keep this open source. So we don't want necessarily to sort of capture a market and say, you must come to us for the bits. So anybody can do this uh, and um, they can download all the files, either from the PyCon website or some of these other sites. I already mentioned Thingiverse. So on Thingiverse, you can find the PyCon with all the instructions, how to build it, and all the files that you need to 3D print. There's another site that people will probably know called Instructables, which is not solely, due, uh, solely down to 3D printing. We got some fantastic support from the Make uh, community. Uh, this is an art two-page spread that we got in Makezine, which is an American maker magazine. Uh, and they even went on to make a 30 minute video showing how to put the PyCon together and how to build it uh, with some very useful ideas as well. Uh, two years ago, I'd actually had uh, the PyCon at the National uh, Science and Media Museum in Bradford. And they asked if I would build one for them and do a a time lapse. So this is the one minute PyCon, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a few things through. What we've got here, these are all the nuts and bolts and springs that go into making an adjustable mirror mount. Um, there's a Raspberry Pi case, which we get from Pi Moroni, but it fits onto this mount. Uh, various nuts, bolts, and screws. There are bits here for making the rack, 
wherever possible, if, if we're going to use bits that are a bit unusual, we'll use 3D printer bits because they're readily available. So the cog is now lo no longer Meccano, it's, it's a 3D printer cog. And the rack actually has a bit of 3D printer belt glued to it uh, to, to make the teeth. So I'll set it going if I can. First of all, we stick the mirror to the mirror mount and uh, just trim it in. But this is just double sided tape and then uh, adjust it with three screws. Uh, moving faster than I can talk, putting the, uh, putting the rack together. Uh, now putting the spider together with the cog that drives the rack and then threading that through. And there we go. And then we just drill a hole to secure the Raspberry Pi to the side of the spider. And then um, just get in the center of gravity uh, to put the dovetail on, which will then go on to uh, the, the uh, tripod. And that's it. Um, the inside of the tube is, is best painted matte black. Um, and um, that's, that's the one minute PyCon. So I just have a sort of look back now. We're on the on the towards the end of the, this presentation, but um, some of the objectives of, of of what we wanted to do. First of all, we wanted to uh, let people access physics through making. Um, so to date, um, we think there are about five thousand pycons. Sorry, five hundred pycons worldwide. Uh, somewhere between four hundred and fifty and five hundred and fifty. That's based on the number of mirrors that we've sold, um, but people can buy their own mirrors and it's open source, so there, there may be more. Uh, this is an old shop when we've sold about 100 and odd to sort of show where they're distributed, um, mainly um, to the USA now, um, probably 50% to the USA, about 25% to Europe, 20% to the UK, and the odd 5% to other places. One of the things we wanted people to do was to share their experiences and share their bills. So we've encouraged people to send us pictures of either of what they built or the results that they've got. So here's uh, um, from a guy in uh, Derby, Chris, who built his PyCon. I uh, met uh, Chris at the Maker Fair in Derby a few years ago. Uh, that's, uh, that's pictures of his build. Uh, this is um, a picture from Ward Hills. Ward runs uh, or is a director of Cambridge Makespace, um, and he's put a compilation together here. So basically, we've got the moon, obviously. This is Jupiter and four moons. I think this is Mars and a very faint uh, Saturn there, uh, but a better shot of it here. Um, and we've got feedback from schools or other organizations. So this is a school in the United States who bought two as a project for the class. The other thing we're very keen to do is get people to make improvements. So the very first improvement on the uh, PyCon came from a company called the Third Earth Design in, I think they're in Wales. And instead of lugging out um, a monitor and a keypad to drive the Raspberry Pi, uh, they came up with a, a very small touch screen. Uh, Chris, who I, I showed you before, uh, went on to convert the PyCon into a not quite conventional uh, Newtonian telescope with an eyepiece. And I won't go into it now, but he built a very ingenious um, uh, focusing device which fits on the side of the PyCon tube and the spider now has a 45 degree mirror. In the United States, uh, and this, this has been going for a, a while, uh, Patrick uh, has actually put together a whole website uh, of what he's done with the PyCon. Uh, I'm quite taken by the idea of motorizing everything. Uh, so basically he's motorized the whole thing right down to the focusing. Um, and um, can swivel the, the pike on around. So it does appeal to me because I don't like standing outside in the cold trying to look through a telescope. So the idea of bringing it inside and, and, and being able to run it from your computer is very appealing. Um, so uh, more, in, more of, uh, there's a link to uh, Patrick's uh, website on the PyCon website. And then the other thing is that we will do is we will try and support people uh, where we can. Um, 
it's not entirely a commercial venture. If we see somebody who we think needs some help, uh, we'll do that. Um, the, uh, during lockdown, uh, uh, some uh, high school graduate, high school students from Argentina got in touch uh, and said that they got a plan and they wanted to take astronomy to underprivileged in their community. And I quite like the idea. Um, and um, I got together with Sky's the Limit, who supply my mirrors, and Alan there and myself shipped them enough bits to make 10 telescopes. Uh, we did a little uh, GoFundMe to pay for some of the shipping costs, and they've given us some feedback. And again, they've, they've done some work to make it into a conventional telescope rather, rather than a Raspberry Pi-driven one. And just for fun, um, I was contacted by somebody who uh, had got a toy which was um, passed down through about two or three generations or, uh, and had broken. And uh, we just put them a new wheel together, which they'd lost. And the, uh, one obviously a very happy little girl there. And the young gentleman on the right uh, started talking to me. I was at a charity event called Soup. And this young man came up and he seemed to know everything about the PyCon. I was quite surprised, but he didn't have one. So we conspired in secret with his parents and he got one for Christmas. Come lockdown, um, I'm a member of the Otley Makerspace. So PyCon, PyCon 3D printers were moved over to printing 3D visors, the 3D printed visors uh, for PPE. And so for the first month or so of the um, pandemic, uh, we were supplying visors as a group uh, from the Otley Makerspace uh, to contacts that we had in, in care homes uh, and even um, friends. I've got a friend who was a, a intensive care nurse and he was telling me some terrible stories about having to reuse equipment. Um, we, we've backed away from doing this now because um, British Standards Institute have started wanting to monitor everything you do or give you certificates to do it. And we simply can't afford that, but we felt we were able to do our part during the pandemic. So the, um, right, so what's, um, the other thing we did was, uh, we were getting so many people with stories and things to do, uh, the feedback from, from the PyCon that I decided, to set up uh, a group on Facebook called uh, PyCon Cohort. And you can go and find this on Facebook. You can join it if you want. You don't have to build a PyCon, but it's a place where people can share their results and share their images and talk to each other. So a bit of summary, what's, what's happened since we did all this um, seven years ago, what's happened to the Raspberry Pi? Uh, its claim to fame was that it was, um, it was taken up with uh, Tim Peake on, the, on his mission on the International Space Station. There were two units, actually. This is a replica of one of them. And he uh, asked for suggestions from the public of what experiments could be done with it. So that's one thing. 3D printing is also on the International Space sta uh, Station. Um, it, the uh, NASA were able to uh, send um, files to the space station, which were for tools, which were specialist tools, which were, were then able to print out on their 3D printer in space. And talking about NASA uh, and actually many other organizations now, so in, in terms of education, um, most major organizations supply 3D printed files free of charge for you to print things. Some of the museums supply files of their artifacts, uh, both NASA and ESA provide files of things as diverse as spacecraft to models of craters. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a 3D model of the Gale crater, uh, which is exaggerated by a factor 10 in the Z direction. Um, things that interest me at the moment, um, I'm seeing a lot of people getting into 3D printed cameras. These are generally film cameras, and they tend to use the lens from an old or canalize a lens from an old, uh, an old camera and then make a new camera around it with 3D printed parts. 3D printers have come down in price considerably. Um, this is when it was the lockdown and I wanted more printing capacity. 
I bought one of these. Um, I think I paid something over £200 for it then. I just checked a few days ago what the price was on, on Amazon Prime. It's £192. This is a, an Ender 3. You can find it cheaper uh, if you're prepared to wait for it to come from China. Um, so the prices have gone down. Um, the Raspberry Pi has gone through many variations since we did the project. So uh, we started off with a Raspberry Pi B, uh, which came out in 2014. It has progressively got better. Uh, it is now up to a Raspberry Pi 4 uh, with up to 8 gig of, of RAM. Uh, and there is a version of the Raspberry Pi 4 called the Raspberry Pi 400, which has its own keyboard and case. So we're back basically to something that looks very like the Sinclair C5, uh, Sinclair uh, ZX Spectrum or the uh, Commodore 64. One interesting development uh, that came about was the Raspberry Pi Zero. So that was released in 2015 and a Wi-Fi version of it released in 2017. Now, this is a very small um, uh, computer, but it is enough to do what you would want to do if you're taking pictures on a PyCon telescope. Now, the thing about this is it does have a camera. Uh, I've not tried it yet. I think we've got somebody on PyCon cohort who has, but it costs about four pounds. And in fact, when I, when I bought one of these, I spent more money on adapters because it uses micro uh, USB adapters. Uh, I spent more money on adapters than I did on the computer itself. There's also a new, uh, camera. Uh, this is uh, a 12 mega. Yes, it's a 12 megapixel camera based on a Sony chip. It's got a larger uh, surface area. It comes without a lens. You you can buy lenses to screw to it, or you can just use it as it is in the PyCon. We've made. You can't see it very well here, but we've made an adapter so that it can be positioned inside the PyCon. Uh, some of my astronomy friends are uh, quite like this, not because it gives any more resolution but because the instruction set that you can use from the Raspberry Pi to the camera means that you can do longer time exposures. So in astronomy, you're always looking to do uh, work with limited light and compensate by doing longer exposures. Uh, so that's, that's the benefit of using that. On the to-do list, uh, there's now a Raspberry Pi 7-inch touchscreen. So on my to-do list, uh, I'm, I'm um, looking at uh, building this onto the tube of the Raspberry Pi and possibly running it from a rechargeable um, USB battery uh, and uh, being able to be much more mobile with the Raspberry Pi. And so that's about where we are with the Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm always doing other things. Um, so one of, one of the things on my to-do list, uh, I'm very much into photography, so I'm looking at how to copy negatives using uh, cameras now. This one is a 24 megapixel camera and uh, there's a move uh, generally for people to uh, photograph negatives rather than put them through scanners. And uh, there's a lot of software around to, to convert the negatives into images. So I'm looking at making a, pr a 3D printed light box and uh, 3D printed negative holders for that. Something that inspired me a few years ago was this lady called Vera Luta who uh, does pinhole photography. And this is an image of the uh, radio telescope at the Max Planck Institute, which she took with a pinhole camera made out of a shipping container. Now, and I don't quite want to go that big, but I'm looking at doing a project where we can do a 3D printed um, pinhole camera, which is the maximum size that we can get on the printer bed, which would be around about um, seven inches in old money. And there's an astronomical um, uh, link to this in that some people use these sort of cameras to do these sort of uh, pinhole exposures. This is the tracks of the sun uh, and it's done with a pinhole camera that's just left somewhere for a year. And then in fact, the, the latent image is so strong that you can see it without developing it. Uh, but it would be a nice thing to, to think about for astronomy because a, a 3D printed camera is very low cost and it doesn't really matter, you could leave it anywhere. So finally, uh, I'd like to finish up really with um, one of the things which came out of this whole project which, which fascinated me 
and uh, my roles uh, in in my career have been very much commercial about marketing and project management uh, and so uh, what came across in, in this whole uh, thing was the support that you can get from platforms if you do want to have a side hustle or a small business uh, and um, it's, uh, that's been a very interesting journey so thank you very much uh, i'm going to leave you here if you want to find out more um, I, I there's my email address uh, there's a pycon website called pyconic everything that i do is on the um, uh, electric works website and finally, if you want to follow my day-to-day -day activities as a retired physicist with diverse things as much as volunteering for the National Trust to converting camper vans, uh, my Instagram is called Replacement Hipster. Thank you very much. Is it time for a few questions, Mark? Yes, indeed. I'm just trying to get rid of stop sharing. There we go. It should have stopped by now. That was excellent. So fascinating. I've got a few questions. Uh, just looking at one from Alex Collins. He says the hardest part is finding a suitable tripod and he can't find any 3D printable ones. Would you consider a tripod mount for the PyCon as a project? Yeah, oh, we, one of, well, there's, there's lots of things to do. <laughs> um, one of the things I've looked at is making a Dobson uh, mount for the PyCon. Um, so, um, and doing it uh, using uh, basically plywood and a few 3D printed parts. So a Dobson uh, really is a bit like a, a telescope on a lazy Susan, Susan that spins round and then tilts up and down. Um, so that, that's uh, something that we've looked at. Um, I've not tried it and I actually at the moment I don't have time to try it, but um, that, that would be a way of doing it. The other thing, I mean, to be quite honest, the other thing this is an exercise in uh, in making, and uh, I just cheat and I've bought uh, cheap um, telescopes with um, uh, usually usually with with uh, astronomical mount, um, but um, and we've thrown the telescope away, um, so that's one way to do it. Um, but uh, no, we, the only the only thing we'd locked out was the Dobson mount. And. Thanks. Alex also says he was part of the initial PyCon funding round. He has his PyCon and several images of the moon, but aligning the mirror was far from easy. Do you have any advice for people about that? Yeah, if you. Um, right, there's, there's a simple way of doing it, which is to just uh, get um, something and um, like a, 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 a drill bit uh, and um, put it between the mirror mount and the back mount so you get the sort of right roughly uh, right uh, positions on all three screws uh, but I'll, if you go to the website and scroll down a bit there's um, a 3d printed laser collimator um, that you can use so you can buy a little laser uh, which would shoot um, a laser beam down the center of the tube and bounce it back off the mirror and um, it's the details of that are on the website. Um, it's it's a standard thing for collimating uh, telescopes anyway. And I think that the actual laser device is about twenty pounds. Thanks. Uh, another one from Jay Smith. He said, "Did you prototype, for instance, in wood before you went into CAD?" Just no. To get the feel of the three D, I suppose. No. Well, it was quite funny. Um, Sheffield University are lovely, but they forgot to tell us that we got the grant until about May. Um, so we were in quite a panic um, to actually get something done. Um, so we just went straight into uh, straight into 3D printing, basically. But it, when I do stuff now, it's quite it's quite easy because if it's wrong, uh, you just go back and adjust it. Um, so I, what was I doing that didn't fit? I was I was making something it didn't fit. Uh, so I just went back into Tinkercad and um, and uh, adjusted it and printed it again. Uh, so that that cycle's probably easier uh, than than making wooden models. Thanks. Chris Anderson says, have you had anything to do with Design Spark, which is free from RS components? No, um, I haven't. Design Spark and three D printing. No. Okay. No, I, I'll, I'll go and check that one out. Right. Um, any plans to find larger mirrors? <laughs> yes, I, I well, 
if anybody wants to have a go and make uh, make their own uh, version, uh, I do have uh, an old telescope that I bought online about four years ago, which has an eight inch mirror in it. Um, and um, it's just a matter, the, the problem is that it, it gets inhibitedly expensive uh, once you get to these larger mirrors. So we, we can get the mirrors uh, from China for the telescope at the moment, which are four and a half inch or 112 millimeters, I think, uh, quite at a quite reasonable price. But once you get up to eight inches, you certainly have to have a parabolic mirror and it all gets very expensive. Um, so um, the only way I can see to do it is uh, very often astronomy clubs um, want to sell a telescope because they moved on to the next thing. Uh, the one I bought um, had uh, no nothing but the basic telescope, no, no, no eyepieces or anything like that. But um, we've not got there uh, doing it. But I, I'm always soliciting for, for people if they want to have a go at designing, I'll, I'm very happy to help them or, or, or give them a mirror if they want to have a go. And can I ask a final question from myself? Uh, do you have to start maybe really reminisce about being a child then going to university to study physics and when I got to university the great shock of finding there was this language I didn't speak called the electronics fine with <laughs> everything else but it was just like somewhere else and the boys around me they spoke it yeah. I had to it was a battle to get through it and then looking at this and thinking about well the things I do at the moment with schools and trying to increase the uptake of physics make it more diverse involve lots of people and thinking about, is there a way that this making this telescope and the thirst for knowledge about astronomy, particularly among young women, could help, or does it help, if you found it anywhere, helping draw young women into physics and actually this technology of becoming a maker? Because there's plenty of young people out there, I think, whole diversity of people want to make stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's this electronics, the, there's not enough women in IT. Could this be yeah. a vehicle to encourage that too? It's an interesting question. Um, so I, I, I have some links to the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, and I have to admit that my partner works for them. So we have many discussions about this. Um, and um, in terms of, a, 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 in the United States, there are many more women astronomers. The, you know, the ratio is better than mm. the UK. Mm. And I think that's, uh, it, uh, I don't want to get into the sort of stereotyping and things, but I, I think that's it because in the United States, the uh, astronomy is taught more uh, like a geography. Um, in, in Britain, all the people I know in astronomy, in fact, the, 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 you know, it's all down to gravitational waves and people wanting to prove physics. Um, so I think that helps. Um, I don't know. I, it's oh gosh, a deep question because you break all the time. You break, you're breaking down these um, stereotypes that people mm. expect, expect to behave as. And you know, I, I I'm of a generation where the girls did domestic science and the boys did woodwork. Um, it, it it it's breaking. It, it takes a long it's, time to break that down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just wonder if this could be a vehicle to help. Yeah, I think making does. Uh, what? Yeah. What? One of the nice outcomes. You know, is I, I showed a picture of the hoists, uh, and I was invited to um, a Methodist church to do something with their um, their sort of scout group, uh, which were all ages and all sexes, and um, we did the hoist thing and this. And, and I got a letter back from a mother uh, saying how proud her daughter was of what she'd made. And it was on the mantelpiece at home mm. with pride of place. And so the only, you know, the way that I sort of go for it is um, I try and ignore these stereotypes and target, um, you know, if I can ta target girls, uh, mm. and get them involved. Um, because, you know, it, oh, it's a very long discussion, but half the problem is that, there's a perception, you know, all this um, 
you know, the girls should be interested in your lipstick and boys should be rough and ready and, and build things. We're smashing that with the Ogden Trust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I would love to talk to you more starting, about it. Yeah. Starting with early years. Yeah. 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 Working with families. I just think there's so much potential in this. That's been a fantastic talk. I can see some thanks in the chat coming in too. Um, really interesting. Fascinating story of how you got there. And the oh. end product that is so, so inspiring and to see it in the news like that as well. Yeah. And that people can make this at home. So yeah. opening up and maybe smashing lots of barriers in that way. And if it can roll out a bit further and get young people involved, maybe yeah. there's lots more to go. So, well, yeah, that, that's, that's so brilliant. Helpful, Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. My my pleasure, and if I can break down the barriers, and uh, yeah, you, the, the early days I do remember, I, I was probably dyslexic, although I was never tested, um, but I always remember, you know, being told off for being lazy and doing these things, and, and the irony is that all that stuff, like you were saying about the electronics, it put me in good stead uh, when mm. I got into industry. Mm. And yeah. I was the opposite way around. Yeah. Well, we'll break the barrier. We'll break the barriers language. down. As yeah, much, get you know. physics to physics across in lots of different languages to lots of people. Thank you so much, and thanks, audience, for being here, and thank you for all the questions. Yes, thank thanks you very Mark. much. That's thanks fantastic. a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Right, we're, are we'll we close, down? We'll yeah. Close, yeah, we can close it now. That was great. Close it down now then. Yeah, right. okay. Thanks. Okay, bye then. Thanks. Bye.